Welcome everyone to episode 46 of the Highly Relevant Podcast. I am your host, Jack Rico, and if you are a first-time listener to this U.S. Latino pop culture show, thank you for discovering us, and please share the show with all of your friends. I'm excited about the show this week. We have some tremendous U.S. Latino guests, such as Latina icon Dolores Huerta and music legend Carlos Santana. I'll tell you a story about him. I had lunch with him. He sat right next to me, and uh, I asked about his playlist, and he said to me, it's mind-boggling. <laughs> um, they spoke to me about their new documentary, Dolores, that focuses on the impact Huerta and Cesar Chavez had in the life of millions of Latino immigrants in the 60s in this country. Then we head over to Cali, Colombia. That is Via Narcos Season 3, and I talked to its Colombian director, Andres Baez, who tells me in a very candid and honest interview about how he wrestles with the dilemma of being a Colombian and filming a cartel show that reopens wounds for many of his people. Also, what is the ultimate fate of the Spanish language in the United States? Will it become Spanglish or will it eventually disappear? Should Univision and Telemundo become English language networks? Should MTV welcome Spanish language music videos? And should Miami Latinos stop speaking Spanish so much and maybe embrace English a little bit more? New York Times national correspondent Simon Romero dropped by the show to discuss his new article on the relationship Latinos have with Spanish in the United States. And did you guys hear about Hispanics break the internet? It's a hashtag that went viral this past weekend and ended up trending number one in the country. Well, I did some detective work and I found the person who revived the hashtag and set off this whole, whole thing. So keep your headphones on. This is the Highly Relevant Podcast. Dolores is an icon. She's a civil rights hero. She's the first general that I followed into war. She's not afraid to speak truth to power. Dolores Huerta, who is an old friend of mine. The FBI knew how dangerous Dolores was. Dolores came up with the slogan, Si se puede. Yes, we can. I was checking my emails the other day, and I was invited to this new screening of a documentary called Dolores. It's about the life and struggles of Latina activist Dolores Huerta. Uh, what I was completely unaware of was that I was actually invited to lunch with her, Carlos Santana, and Peter Bratt. That's Benjamin Bratt's brother. And uh, apart from the documentary being very enlightening and setting the record straight on some falsehoods, one of the exciting things for me was to be able to ask them about what this documentary actually represented to us at this time in America, as well as American identity and what we can do to improve our status in this country. Here's a listen at those conversations. So Peter, um, I hear that you're the director of the, the new Dolores documentary. Uh, how did this project get done? See that man over there? Carlos, Carlos Santana? Santana? <laughs> Picked up the phone, man, and said, we gotta do this, we gotta do this film now. What's your relationship with Carlos and how, how did you guys connect on this particular topic of doing a documentary on Dolores? Uh, he's from the Mission District of San Francisco and he had seen La Mission. And, uh, and we, we became brothers, you know, uh, years ago when La Mission came out and we had always talked about wanting to collaborate but never really finding the, the one project. And then one day out of the blue he called and uh, he was set on telling the story. Why was he set on this? I mean, because this could have been made 10 years ago too. It still has the same relevance as it is today. What, why, t why, why now? I mean, that's probably a question better suited for him. I was my mother. Inwardly, my mother passed, but when, uh, after she passed, she told me, you got to do this, you must do this, and you will do this. You know, I want you to fund it. I want you to that, select the, the, the people who are going to honor this frequency of elegance, excellence, integrity. So I give all the credit to my mom. She's the one that made me do it. What were the, some of the things that you were looking for this documentary to create? Was it a reinterest in Dolores Huerta and the farm workers' uh, plight? Equality, fairness, and justice. It, 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 we're, in, we're in the same page, her and I. We, we want the same thing, you know? Uh, she's no different than Bob Marley or Marvin Gaye or John Lennon, you know? She does it her way, we do it up with music. But it's the same thing. We want to wake up people to their totality. You're not the little me. You're not the little wretched sinner. You're not the unworthy of God's grace. You're not that. You're a beam of light. Carry yourself like it. 
Dolores Huerta, eh, primero que todo, un placer. Uh, it is an honor to meet you. You're 87 years old and you're still fighting for social justice. Why has this been such an important subject matter for you throughout your lifetime? Well, I mean, the main thing is that I do believe that if we organize folks that they, and we teach them how to fight for their own rights, you know, that they can actually make it happen. And so uh, this is why I, I am so addicted to organizing. And especially now when the time that we're living in right now, that we know that we can overcome these prejudices and these racism and all of these obstacles. But the, pero lo tenemos que hacer. We have to get out there and do it. We can't expect that somebody's going to do it for us. And do you feel that the plight when you first entered this with Cesar Chavez, do you feel it's still the same? Or you feel, do you feel that all the work you've done has finally improved? Oh yeah, it's definitely made a difference, but we know that uh, the injustices are so huge that we still have a lot of work to do. But the one thing that I love about the work that we did, and the one thing I love about the, mu the movie Dolores, it, it, it really gives us, a, uh, I think, inspiration to let us know that we can, we can make it happen, you know? When you think of the farm workers that they were against, uh, the president of the United States, Richard Nixon, the governor of California, Ronald Reagan, right. uh, the, uh, the Farm Bureau Federation, the most powerful grower organization, and yet we won <laughs> uh, right, by, right. The, by the power of the people. And so that's you know, really what inspires me to keep working and, and to keep giving people that message and to you know let them know that they've got to get become involved. They've got to become engaged and then, and then we can take the power. We can take that power because it belongs to us in the first place. How do you feel about a documentary being done about you? I heard from many people that you, feel, you felt almost uncomfortable with the documentary being called Dolores and for it being about you because I know you're such an unselfish person so many people shared in this how do you feel about this message about you your legacy finally being talked about to a new generation of Latinos and everybody else well the, the thing is that we know in the farmer community we had five people that were killed the first one a young Jewish girl from Boston named Nan Friedman uh, the second one a young Arab named Nadia Daifala and then Juan de la Cruz a, a Latino farm worker Rene uh, Uh, Lopez, a young 19-year-old, the other, uh, Contreras. So all of these people, all the people that were beaten up, all the people that were taken to jail, and so I feel like you know, uh, I kind of represent, the, you know, what happened. But there were so many people that did the work, you know, to to be able to finally bring a little bit of justice to farm workers. So in that respect, I just think that. Uh, for me, I can't really take credit. I'm glad that I was able to, you know, be a part of the movement to be able to do some of the changes that we did. And all of the people that boycotted grapes, you know, the 17 million Americans. You know? Right. So it's, it's, it's an army of people, you know, that fought for the farm workers. And so that's why sometimes I think that it's wrong for me to take credit, so to speak. Because we have to give credit to so many other Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Yeah. In the movie, in the documentary, you said that you didn't feel you were American, that you were never going to feel like you were American. Do you still feel that today? Well, you know, as a person of color, uh, as you know, uh, we get these little microaggressions, uh, you know, every day, if not every week of our lives, and it's still happening. And uh, I think until we uh, kind of erase and abolish the whole issue of racism and sexism, then I do think... Do you think we, that's something that can actually happen? I, I, I do. I think it's going to happen. I think it's accelerated now with President Trump, what happened in Charlottesville, where you had uh, I, people who were Anglos who were now being victims of the racism, you know, as what happened in Charlottesville. And, of course, that happened also in the Civil Rights Movement. But I think that everybody's realizing now that all of us have to do something to end it. You know, it's it's because if not, it's going to bring our country down, mm -hmm. and our country is is so powerful in this world, it's going to affect the whole world. And so it's incumbent upon us now, each and every one of us, especially our organizations, our public organizations, our private organizations, that we all take responsibility and start working to end the racism. So do you feel American? Do you identify as American or as a Mexicana? Well, I, I consider myself a, a, a Mexican-American, right? Yeah. <laughs> Even yeah. though I, my family's been here for many, I'm like a fifth generation right. in the United States of America, you know. And, uh, but I think that, yeah, I still identify, I think, as a Mexican-American uh, because I do believe that that is my heritage mm -hmm. and I, and I want to hold on to that heritage, you know, and embrace it. Uh, right. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. I think that that's, I think that's, that's the beauty of our country, that we can have our culture and right. we can have our traditions, you know. 
and yet still be American. And, mm. and we also say, you know, being American is all the way from, from uh, you know, Canada all the way to, to uh, Peru, you know? Because it says, this is the Americas. Yes. We are all Americans. Right. And, and I think the film is a line there when somebody says, we were Americans before, eran los americanos, you know, before America was America. <laughs> right. And then my final question is, do you still feel that Latinos are still underrepresented in our country in politics, sports, arts, movies, music. Why do you think that is, and how do we solve that problem? And, and I think a lot of that uh, happened, uh, you know, a few years ago when they started attacking Latino immigrants, and then all of a sudden you saw that instead of increasing our Latino presence, it was actually getting smaller, you know? And I think we can say that too about our African American community also. You know, we are not properly represented. And I How think do we it, solve that? I think that we have to start fighting that even when we think of movies. If it was not for the Latino participation in buying movie tickets, I mean, the industry wouldn't be able to make Absolutely, it, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and I think we've just got to keep pressuring and uh, you know, do what we have to do uh, to make sure that that changes. Who is the new Dolores Huerta? for our generation, who, that you can put the torch on them, says it's now your time to lead us into the next, into the future. Well, I think we've already seen that with the dreamers. You know, the dreamers were out there, all these young Latinas and Latinos that were over there fighting uh, for their right to stay here in this country, to be able to go to college, to get the driver's licenses, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we see a lot of, uh, all around us, uh, there's a Gabby Pacheco, uh, who is from, uh, I, I, she's from uh, Central America, somewhere, and she's a big uh, leader in Miami, and also she did the Thousand Mile March all the way to Washington, yeah. D.C. for the Dreamers, you know, and there's so many of these young women that are out there. I see them everywhere. They're just, we have a lot of a lot, a lot of young people that are going to definitely uh, make major, major strides and make major improvements in our country. Latina girls need to see statues of you. We really got to set the record straight. I mean, women cannot be written out of history. It's time for Jack Dinn. Let's begin with the top movie news of the week. The Equalizer sequel with Denzel Washington adds Chilean director Pedro Pascal releasing September 14th, 2018. You could be renting new release movies from your home for $30 very soon. Warner Brothers is making a Joker origin movie with Martin Scorsese involved. Bohemian Rhapsody movie casts Queen bandmates. Mary Magdalene the movie moves to Easter weekend March 30th, 2018 with Joaquin Phoenix playing Jesus. And influential comedian Jerry Lewis passed away this week at age 91. In TV news, CBS, NBC, ABC, and Fox were met by the National Latino Media Council to fix diversity immediately. Jerry Seinfeld will have his own comedy special on Netflix September 19th. MTV renews Fear Factor for season two. And Stranger Things on Netflix will end after season four. Switching over to music, Taylor Swift's new album will be called Restoration, releasing November 10th, just in time for the Thanksgiving holidays. VH1 is planning a behind-the-scenes special of Ricky Martin's Vegas residency. J Balvin's filmed live concert Brutal will premiere Friday, September 8th on HBO Latino. And Sesame Street parodied Despacito with El Patito. It's hilarious. Listen. El Patito. Rubber Ducky. Oh, El Patito es mi favorito. Donde quiera que vaya a hacer su sonido. El Patito es tu buen amigo. El Patito. In digital and social media news, Samsung released the Galaxy Note 8 this week and everybody's raving about it. Snapchat will move into scripted content by year's end. LinkedIn becomes the newest platform to embrace user-generated videos. Musical.ly launches major update to video app which could broaden its audience. And Hulu launched a revamped app and live TV service on Xbox 360. And in Broadway news, John Leguizamo's Latin History for Morons will be headed to Broadway. And Disney's Frozen Musical will open March 22nd, 2020. 2018 at the St. James Theater. Cocaine cartels are about succession. The day Pablo went down, the Cali cartel became public enemy number one. Their operations had grown into the biggest cocaine cartel in history. 
All right, you narco Netflix lovers. Season three begins September 1st and revolves around the Cali Cartel this season. Uh, many of the scenes were filmed in Cali, Colombia. I'm not sure if you knew that. And I had a candid, honest conversation with director Andres Baiz, who's also from Cali, about the dilemma of him profiting from drug violence content, reopening old wounds in Colombia, and the difference between narcos versus Telemundo Univision cartel shows. I caught up with Andres at a press event here in New York. Uh, Andy, primero todo, un placer conocerte. Uh, congratulations on Narcos season three. Uh, did you feel that season three was actually going to happen when season one no. came out? No, no, no. I had no idea. I didn't expect it. Um, actually, being from Colombia, mm -hmm. I wasn't even expected. I, I didn't even expect it, Narcos to be such a hit because right. for me, it's such a. Um, I was. We've done shows before on Narcos, you know, it's like, oh, again, we're going to do a show on Narcos, etc. Right. So for me, being a Colombian, I never expected it to be such a huge hit in the world. Right. And so I was really, really happy, you know, and it took me by surprise. Um, I was listening to your q and I'm Colombian myself. Mis padres son de Barranquilla, Colombia. So, costeño. Um, born here in the United States, and I was hearing you talk about uh, how Colombians had a problem with, mm -hmm. and this is this happened to me when I went to Medellin. Uh -huh. They were like, we don't want to talk, like kind of mm -hmm. hide it under the rug. Mm -hmm. In your case, why should people watch Narcos? Why should Colombians watch Narcos? Do you feel that by making a cartel show, there's a level of glorification to this that shouldn't happen anymore. You, you know, that question comes a lot, the level of glorification. When one, when a, when a director uh, um, decides to be part of a show like Narcos... Mm -hmm. Especially a Colombian one. Right? Especially a Colombian one, exactly. Then, and they ask you that question about the, about the glorification, and it's a controversial issue, you choose to defend decide on whether no it's not a glorification you know it's the truth it's what happened now is that it's your business monster. part defending it or is that a now now defending? honestly i can say i don't know i don't know if it's so you're at if, a crossroads it, it, it's a crossroads it's controversial there's always two sides of the coin in, in those terms and 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 in, and i think it all depends on who's watching um if you are a the show's meant for everyone. Though, it is right? meant for everyone. It is meant for everyone, and and it's a hard question to answer. I, as a director, I'm I'm so happy that I can do a show that involves that I can do poetry with the filmmaking, you know. And if the audience is when they watch the show and they watch specific scenes that I love and I know there's art in it right. and they're able to see their art then for me as a filmmaker I'm happy we never try to we never try as filmmakers as filmmakers or writers to glorify we never try it but the fact is that these characters are so interesting and they are fighting against the system and any character that fight, fights against the establishment or against the system becomes um, they are interesting people like them people like the the, the, guy, the the bad guys and an actor is never gonna judge himself or herself and say I'm gonna play this uh, so that people hate me because I don't want people I don't want this character to be glorified right so so but whether it glorifies or not, it might, there might be some level of glorification without one, us wanting to. There, mu right. there, there might be, for so, sure. So, Univision Telemundo, uh -huh. they're right mm -hmm. now known for creating narco novellas. Mm -hmm. uh, you have La Reina del Sur. Mm -hmm. What is your perspective on the way Spanish language television uh, represents these types of narco content compared to what you're doing at Netflix? Oh, oh for me, it's a hundred percent different. I don't. I as a filmmaker, I wanted. I want to do a show where I have free creative freedom. What I have, where I have time to do to do scenes that. I, you know, I can, I, so they they have a certain standard of quality, mm -hmm. and that I, um, that actors have the time to find the truth right. in their in their you know in their craft, and um, of course we have more money to do it, but also there's a f there's a freedom given to the creative minds in the show, uh, and that's why I think there's a lot of poetry in the show. Mm -hmm. So. And there's a lot of, re again, I th 
one another thing that I think is beautiful about Narcos is that it criticizes the drug and wars in, in general, and it right. criticizes also the American involvement in the drug and the war. So it's not one sided. Um, so in 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 those terms, it's very thought provoking. I don't even watch the narco novelas. I don't care for them. They if they offer me one, I would say no, just because because now, you were part of the metastasis, right? I was part the of metastasis. Yes, Mimas, which was completely yeah. a remake of the American version, but made much faster. Breaking Bad, uh, the Breaking Spanish, Bad. Right. Yes, the Spanish version. It's a copy. That's what it is. Yeah. You know, uh, did I have fun doing it? Of course. <laughs> um, did they take a risk doing that that show? Of course. It's a ri you know they don't write shows like that in Latin America with those certain you know with that types of risks. So it was I was very very happy and I learned a lot uh, to be part of it. But I don't like the way those products are done. I Is it the format? The format. The format. I'm talking about the Describe format. Describe the format. What's the, that uh, big difference? The big difference is format. that is that we in Latin America we don't really have seasons. We don't. We don't. You know. So it's a or, continuous. Or I'm going to talk yeah, yeah. about Colombia specifically, Season? and I know this is this applies for many other countries. But we, you know, for example, Narcos. We we do ten episodes in eight months. In Colombia, they produce. 70 episodes <laughs> in six months. Okay, yeah, it's a factory. Okay, it's, yeah. it's a factory, and we, when there's no another thing is that in Narcos there's a director per episode or or, or every two episodes. So mm -hmm. so a direct a director can take care of that episode. It's their episode, and they can you know they can they can build it and create it as they wish. Mm -hmm. In a show like that, it's basically three or four directors making scenes not episodes so, making right. scenes and then they get all these scenes and then they 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 mesh them together they, they, exactly they tape them together they they glue them together <laughs> and then there's your episode but we don't know <laughs> if i directed this scene and if the next director directed the next scene you know yeah. what i mean there's no coherence there and also post production is done so quickly that they edited without any um, right. it becomes a little sloppy to a certain extent it becomes extent. very sloppy it right. becomes the truth. It becomes really sloppy. Let me ask you this. Uh -huh. Do uh -huh. you think a show like Narcos would mm -hmm. exist outside of Netflix? You think that we have a channel right now that rivals the Netflix freedom of creativity I don't think to so. be able to make a show like I don't this? think so. I think one of the I think one of the great things about Netflix and, and, and it's that it's that creative is that they take risks, that they're speaking to the world, not to a specific audience. Mm -hmm. You know, because Netflix is you know, everyone who has Netflix, whether it's in Denmark, in Nigeria, in Japan, in Colombia, in Mexico, you know, they're gonna they're, they can watch the same content. So Netflix is speaking to the world, uh, and they take risks, and they depend on talent. Right. You know, it's it, people always say that television is a producer's medium. Well, Netflix has made it more of a uh, a filmmaker's medium. That's cool. You know, and that's, and, great. And that's what I love about it. Mm -hmm. The appeal of narco content, mm -hmm. narco shows. Queen of the South on USA, mm -hmm. obviously it's all over uh, Spanish language television. Mm -hmm. uh, ABC was trying to do one called Las Reinas. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the appeal? What is it that people like so much about drug lords and violence and... I think it's, I, I mean, violence, I think it's just part of our nature, and there's a cathartic element, I think. In, in, not about narco shows per se, but I think violence in film, in television, I think there's a cathartic element. Uh, uh, because violence, we need to accept it as part of our DNA, in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a but primal it's instinct. It's primal instinct. Now, why narcos? I think, I don't know, I don't have the, the, the answer. Uh, but the but I do think that it has to do with the fact that narcos are um, they're anti-establishment <laughs> and 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 they buck against ex law. Right? They buck against law. They buck, buck against elites, economic you know economic elites, political elites, kind of populism today, you know. Right. So. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, um, and that cre that people like that people you know they see they can see, you know it's a it's they see in them a way to express their own anxieties their own um, 
what, you know what they're mad about or you know what, I think so it's one of my right. one of the many theories um, there might be another reason which I, I would ha I would hate if it's this is that you know uh, the fact that these people get rich so quickly and they buy Lamborghinis and Ferraris and and, it's and, attractive. and, and it, that's attractive but that's that's what is least attractive to me as a filmmaker you know that I won't you know I think consumerism society is the worst thing that can happen have, happen to the world I agree and and um, and I would hate audiences to find in that uh, 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 truth or that's where happiness uh, lies you know right yeah final uh, question mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you talked about how Colombians uh, that watched the show felt that the controversy was that the accents what's were one the same. Of, what's one of the, yeah. That affected me too. And uh -huh. I think that every Colombian that watches that understands sure. phonetically what accents should be like. Mm -hmm. Where do you lie? Where do you stand about authenticity when it comes to accents and roles within actors in a Hispanic content? Well, medium? you know, it's, it's, it's... Latin America in general, it's... It, if you go to Chile, to Peru, to Argentina, to Colombia, to Bolivia, and, you know... It, They, everyone speaks a very specific accent. You can when you when you when you meet someone from Venezuela, when you meet someone from Mexico, when you meet someone from Argentina, from Chile, you can r tell right away immediately immediately that they're from that country. Um, uh, in Colombia, you can bring that to the specific. You can know if a person is from Cali, from Medellin, from Cartagena, from Barranquilla, Agreed. from Bogotá. It's actually accents in Colombia are very much specific mm -hmm. from region to region. That authenticity is important and, and I understand that uh, the, the immediate reaction you have when you watch an act, when you it's hear an actor, so it's sure. distracting. What I, what I say in favor of the opposite is that I prefer to work with a great actor with a bad accent than with a okay actor And that a great does accent. that with a great actor. <laughs> uh -huh. That's true. Uh -huh. All right. Andres, uh -huh. muchísimas gracias, right. eh? Se agradece. Muchas gracias. If you're looking for some new songs to listen to, check out these three tracks you might want to add to your playlist this weekend. Es tarde, Juanes. Look what you made me do. Taylor Swift. Look what you made me do. Look what you just made me do. Look what you just made me do. He started when I looked in her eyes. I got close and I'm like, what? Reggaeton Lento, CNCO featuring Little Mix. I don't have to tell you guys about the rising wave of anti-immigrant sentiment in our country. If you don't see it, you're blind. So what does this mean for the future of Spanish language and for Latinos who love to speak it? Is it here to stay? Is it going to evolve into Spanglish or will it disappear? New York Times national correspondent Simon Romero wrote an article this week that explores the topic of Spanish, its history, its present time, and its future. He joins me now on the podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Now, the timing of this article is very interesting because this comes at a time to me where Spanish, little by little, as a Hispanic, as a Colombian American who speaks English first and Spanish second and who has a mom who still watches Univision and all the, you know, the Paquetazo Time Warner cable, you know, uh, channels and everything. Um, how I've seen Spanish slowly start to erode from our country. And this has this is proven through uh, research from the Pew Center. This has been proven from the rating declines at Univision and Telemundo, uh, the immigration uh, declines, uh, as well as the government who's actually driving it. And it's coming also at an anti-immigrant sentiment in our country that's led mostly by the White House. Um, 
Why did you want to write this article? Was it a way for you to revive the conversation and the beauty and passion that the language has in our country and not to lose it? What experience did you go through that sparked and triggered this article? It's just a wonderful question. Um, I've uh, long been uh, just fascinated and intrigued by all of the different languages that, that we speak. Um, for uh, the previous 11 years, I mean, I was based in Latin America as a foreign correspondent for the New York Times, um, uh, six years in Brazil, and then five years before that in Venezuela. So I roamed around the region. And I just moved back to the United States to take up this new posting as a national correspondent uh, based in the Southwest in Albuquerque uh, last month. So just I've only been back for a few weeks. And I was really just struck um, by the by how much um, by the spread of Spanish in the time when I've been out of the country, especially in New Mexico, which I was born and where, where I grew up. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I, I grew up uh, speaking Spanish, mainly Spanglish, you know, the, the mixture of the two languages. Um, but uh, it, it just I was really impressed by how immigrants, especially from northern Mexico, uh, from other parts of Mexico, some from Central America, some Salvadorans are injecting this new uh, vitality into the language um, in New Mexico. It, w it was just something which really uh, sort of hit me right away. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow. Which is, which is the language that you most speak frequently? Is it English or is it Spanish? You know, I speak English most frequently. I mean, of course, you know, for the for the work that I do and I write in English, but at at home, actually, I speak largely English and Portuguese because my wife is Brazilian and and that's where my kids have been growing up for the past uh, six years. And they consider themselves to be very Brazilian. So, so you so know, when Spanish we're is not really together, a part of the everyday language in your in your household and in your professional life. Now, what about socially? Oh, socially, I speak a lot of Spanish socially and professionally as you know, part of this. Uh, new job that I'm doing involves covering immigration, so it's uh, I'm speaking a lot of Spanish. I'm I'm actually you know talking to you today from Phoenix. I was uh, here this week to cover the protests uh, against Trump's mm -hmm. rally, and uh, it was fascinating to see the 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 huge turnout of people on the streets of the city. Um, and and speaking Spanish, as you know, as a journalist, is just um, an incredible advantage in in terms of coming into um, just make you know breaking the ice with people getting access making them feel comfortable um so it's a big part of the job that i do i and i should also say that we that we, we do speak uh, you know uh, some spanish at home too you know because we you know we lived in venezuela my wife learned how to speak spanish there very well um and you know a lot of my relatives in new mexico uh speak spanish and so you know on the on the, you know going into stores grocery stores restaurants uh flea markets, everything else, you know, daily life in New Mexico also involves speaking a lot of Spanish. Right. Now, you really, really describe cool. that very well in your article. But what is the main argument you're trying to establish with this article? Well, you know, I, I really think that, um, uh, you know, few people recognize this because when you grow up in a in an English dominant country uh, and of course we're we're living now and working in an English speaking superpower, which is the United States, it's easy to overlook the fact that Spanish actually has more native speakers around the world than English does. Um, it's second only to Mandarin Chinese in native speakers. Right. They have and, about 800 million speakers in Mandarin throughout the world. We have 437, but it's broken down to three categories because I read a lot of the research that you did. Uh, overall, it's about 567 million people throughout the world speak Spanish, which is a <laughs> massive amount of number where I think English comes in fourth or fifth. Yeah, it's it's just astonishing, really, the 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 breach and the breadth that, that Spanish has. And this is accomplished um, without the support of a military superpower in the world, right? Because, you know, Spain's empire collapsed uh, many decades ago. You know, the largest Spanish speaking country in the world is Mexico, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't project its power through military force. Um, so it's so it's largely done through through soft power, which is really fascinating through cultural exports, 
through film and music um, and on social media, of course. Um, and, you know, talking to historians and linguists, one of the main reasons uh, for this vibrancy that Spanish has, um, you know, not just in the Spanish speaking, not just in Spanish speaking countries in Latin America or Spain, um, but also in the United States is is the is a concept called entropy, which draws from thermodynamics um, and ref it refers to disorder. And so they they talk about the disorder that resulted from the collapse of Spain's empire and the creation of all of these different republics um, around Latin America and also the use of Spanish in places like Equatorial Guinea in Africa. Uh, the Philippines and in Asia, and and the fact that this allows people to you know from the Spanish speaking world to move around these countries with a certain amount of ease you know whether it's exiles from Spain's dictatorship moving to Venezuela back in the 30s and 40s uh, you know or you know Cubans moving to South Florida in recent decades um, you know you have Venezuelans now moving to places like Chile. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's really interesting, and it, it's all, there's also it also creates an economic market for um, cultural production. So if you're a screenwriter, uh, or you know maybe even a YouTuber right now, in a place like like Argentina, you know you don't have to depend only on your own market. You know you can you can be thinking that oh wow you know what I'm doing on on YouTube right now can be consumed across the Atlantic and in Spain, right, globally. in Mexico, you know, in California, uh, in so many different places. And that's one of these sort of uh, underestimated strengths that Spanish has that I just really found fascinating. You've done a lot of research for this, obviously, through uh, just reading your article. What was the stat or the number that most stood out to you out of all of this that you just were changed maybe by what you discovered? You know, I was really amazed by the estimates of uh, Spanish speakers in the United States, um, especially at a time when, you know, languages are increasingly politicized. Uh, you know, this is a very polarizing uh, phase of history now for this country. And, you know, et es these estimates reach as high as 50 million uh, Hispanohablantes, you know, Spanish speakers in this country. Some people say there are less. Some people say there are more. There are different ways of measuring the number. But uh, but when you hear a number like that, it's just like, wow, it's it's incredible because that is more Spanish speakers than in Spain, the cradle of the language. It's more than in, uh, you know, Colombia, where, you know, they, they take they take immense pride and care with the, the Spanish that they speak. Yeah, it's more than Argentina. It's more than any other country except for Mexico. Um, and it's really remarkable, you know, and, you know, within that that number of that universe of speakers in the United States, you know, there's a city like Los Angeles, which has four million Spanish speakers. That's more than the entire country of Uruguay. Wow. And, you know, linguists linguists have identified the, you know, how a new form of Spanish, a new dialect of Spanish is now coalescing in Los Angeles, which I just found fascinating. You know, I mean, it's, it's different from Mexican Spanish. Yeah, Very it's similar, Spanglish. Of course. That's what it is. But, it's Spanglish yeah, but, thrown in with uh, other dialects from Mexico and the United States, and it's creating something brand new. And and before we get to that, I, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, before we talk about Spanish, it has its own like category and bubble. Do you think that the United States should officialize English as their main language. You know, I'm a big uh, believer in uh, linguistic diversity, the advantages of being bilingual or trilingual or speaking multiple languages. That is the norm in many places around the world. I think it's, uh, it's a statement, it's a reflection of the times that we're in, that mm. uh, there are authorities around the country who are seeking to prioritize English. Um, of course, I don't think that there's anything wrong at all with with learning English as well as possible um, and becoming extremely fluent in, in speaking and writing English. I mean, that, that only opens doors, you know, professionally, culturally, uh, enables you to travel the world. There, there, but but, you know, there's a there's a lot to be said with, uh, uh, you know, with with prizing the languages that that the other languages that we have, and not just Spanish. I mean, there are a lot of other 
languages from around the world. And it's what makes the United States such a remarkable society is the the capacity to absorb people from all of these different places and, and, and draw on their talents. Uh, I lived in Miami uh, for several years. I'm from New York, but my mom has been living there for almost 20 years. And, uh, you know, I have a mixed relationship with this. I, re I still remember the day that I walked into a supermarket. It was a Publix. And I walked in there and I remember the woman... I had not spoken to her. I was just, you know, I, I put my grocery list uh, right on the uh, conveyor belt. And as she's looking at it, she decided to speak to me in Spanish. And I looked at her and I said, okay. A, she doesn't know English and she's asking in Spanish. But the assumption that I have to speak to her in Spanish was the thing that rubbed me the wrong way, especially because I was living in Miami, not in Latin America. And so in Miami, there's there's this tendency to speak Spanish first in the United States, in, an, in American soil, as opposed to English. And I feel like a lot of Latin Americans kind of forget that we're living in the United States and that English is probably the unifier language, not Spanish. That that's something that makes them insular that doesn't necessarily make them better. So... I feel always that the etiquette should always be speak to someone in English first and then kind of just, you know, make your way to Spanish or another language, depending on that. Where do you lie about the life style of language in Miami when it comes to Spanish and people speaking or wanting to speak Spanish first instead of English? You know, I think my, my, Miami is just like... Uh, uh fascinating example i'm always like amazed when i you know the moment i land in the miami airport I, you know get into a uh, a car or rent a car and, and people start speaking spanish i'm like wow uh I, I find it really cool actually i mean i and it's also like almost a reflection of the the economic lifeblood of the of the city um in that you know miami is a crossroads for many people from from around latin america it's a place where they do business they do banking uh you know they produce music they produce culture um and then they export it uh you know all around the region um and so i think it's a, in, in in some sense you know a recognition of that that strength that Miami has. Um, interestingly enough, you know, in, in speaking with linguists in Miami, they they tell me that Spanish is actually starting to fade. Um, among, really? Um, um, among new generations, yeah, among uh, children of immigrants, even, even immigrants themselves who came to uh, Miami to, at a young age, that there is a, 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 a status preference among some people to prefer <laughs> oh, English wow. over over Spanish. So so they they explained that Spanish may not have its sort of place at the at the top of the hierarchy in Miami um, for much longer. I found that amazing. I mean, it's really interesting. I do because, too. You know, as you as you, you know, said. Yeah, it, it was it was just fascinating, and and I guess there are you know there are various reasons for that. Um, you know, English has a special cachet. I mean, of course, you know, people want to you know, move up in life. They want to, you know, aspire to they, bigger things. They, they, yeah. they, they want to aspire to bigger things. They want to go to university and they, they want to do that in the United States. And to do that, you need to speak English very well. Right. Um, so, so even in Miami, there's this sort of sense of flux that is, that is taking place. I couldn't mm. work that into the article. You know, there wasn't enough space, unfortunately. That's but why did, this I podcast just, is here. You get I to really squeeze it, it in now. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Um, definitely. Telemundo and Univision are in Miami. Do you feel that after what you just told me about uh, the younger generation adopting English and Spanish fading a little bit, do you think at some point that these two companies need to also sort of modify uh, the way they communicate to their viewers, especially the younger viewers uh, of the new generation? Do you think that, um, that, that, that they should maybe embrace a level of English? You know, I think in a in a sense, uh, they already are. Um, you see the the gradual creep of Spanglish into uh, much of the advertising that appears on those networks. Um, I saw two of them, know, Mia Mundo that you had on the article and the Wendy's mm -hmm. bilingual commercial about pan de pretzel. It's, yeah, it's just amazing. Uh, pan de pretzel, you know, it, I mean, it, but it was it was something that kind of 
you know, resonated with people. And it's, you know, and, and those are very large corporations that, that do their market research very thoroughly and very well. And they find that that's one of the best ways to reach out to this huge market. Um, and, and, you know, you, you, you also see them experimenting with the way that languages are mixing um, in the in the telenovelas that are that they're producing, which is which is really interesting. Um, and I think it's just natural, you know, I mean, it's really hard to predict how languages will evolve. Uh, you know, so it depends on so many different factors on, on immigration flows, on politics, um, on the economy, on, on so many different things. But, you know, h- historians sometimes compare where, where Spanish is at right now in the United States, at least the way that it's mixing with, Um, with English to such a large extent uh, with where Spanish was back in the 12th or 13th centuries um, when it was mixing a lot with Arabic. You know, the the Moors had made these huge inroads into the Iberian Peninsula at that time. Spanish absorbed a huge amount of vocabulary from Arabic, Uh, you know, of course, having originally developed from Latin centuries earlier and then uh you know there was a a king uh king Al- Re- el rey alfonso you know who mm-hmm. who spearheaded this effort to to really establish the the grammatical structure of spanish in a very coherent way and start using spanish as a language of knowledge um and, and a language also of the of the uh, royal bureaucracy, which was a, a very important move in sort of elevating the status of Spanish. And, you know, Spanish was was at that time a mixture of these different influences, you know, language, right. you know, as 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 is English in many ways, you know, drawing on its Germ- Germanic roots, uh, you know, the Norman invasion, the, the influence that French has had. Um, and, you know, it's easy to also overlook sometimes, but Spanish has already influenced language uh you know the the english language in oh many absolutely ways. Yeah, um, yeah you can see it in movies you can see it in pop culture um yeah and, and speaking of yeah. that evolution of spanish do you feel that we should legitimize spanglish as a language since that's where we headed to you spoke about how many grammar professionals are irked when people speak spanglish but when you talk to like groups like bomba stadium you listen to the music scene at this moment you notice that they're speaking bilingually. So is there a, an argument to legitimize Spanglish in this country? You know, it's a it's a fascinating discussion. And uh, even the sort of the most ardent, uh, you know, grammarians out there sometimes recognize that it's beyond their control. Um, the ways in which people, you know, use language, um, especially when it comes to uh, music and writing and and uh, poetry, film and everything, you know, that reflects the way that it's used on a daily basis. And in a way, it's kind of like anarchic and chaotic. So it's really challenging to try to to try to assert control over that process. Um, I think that Spanglish has much greater a, a bigger degree of acceptance of acceptance today than it did say 10 know, years ago. like a decade mm-hmm. or a decade and a half ago um you know you see scholars who are translating works like don quixote or you know the little prince into spanglish um you you see just a lot more spanglish that's used especially in in advertising as companies sort of you know try to reach out to these new markets um so I think some of that is just inevitable. Um, and, and again, it's all happening in this immense kind of laboratory that the United States <laughs> is. Yeah, the incubator the language. of languages yeah. and, uh, and yeah, cultures. And, and, it, and it's starting to influence the way that Spanish is, is used in other parts of the Spanish-speaking world in Latin America. You know, I mean, when you go to, you know, a, a friend just moved to Mexico City, for example, and he was remarking, hey, you know, it's amazing how people say bye all the time, <laughs> and even 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 when they're speaking Spanish. You know, they're like, you know, it's, instead of saying adios, um, you know, these little things are, you know, sort of happening. And it's just part of the way that, uh, that the languages are shifting and evolving. Two more questions, and uh, hopefully you can weigh in on this. I've been having conversations uh, in the last episodes of, uh, of our podcast about uh, MTV 
and how they did not nominate Despacito for their VMAs, which is happening this weekend. And it kind of brought a deeper conversation about language and, and music and, and music networks. And um, do you think that that radio stations, their English language radio stations, English language media outlets, uh, the MTVs of the world, do you think they should start playing more Spanish language music videos? You know, I really do think that some of it is just inevitable. Uh, the kind of, you know, the runaway success of Despacito, whether you like the song or not, I, I personally really do. Actually, I find it'll just a, an amazing and a, an amazing. It's one heck of, of a music. catchy tune. <laughs> I'll give yeah, you that. Yeah, it, sta- it stays with you. You know, um, I, you know, it, it's just astounding. I'm th- maybe even beyond the expectations of the uh, of the people who produced it. You know, I was talking to uh, one linguist who had traveled to Kazakhstan of all places in Central Asia this summer, and he had remarked how you know he was. In a, in a shopping area, and lo and behold, the song that they were playing was Despacito <laughs> in, you know, wow. in, in, the, in, the, in the middle of Central Asia. So, so, so you know, I mean, Spanish has that capacity um, to be exported and consumed around the, the world, especially in musical form, in, in just this astonishing way. Um, so I think some of it in the U S is going to be inevitable. I mean, yeah, I'm sure that there are, you know, there's an establishment that of course, you know, uh, prefers to, uh, separate things and have, you know, English separate, a separate, yeah, like Spanish, you got the Grammys but, and you have the Latin yeah. Grammys, which I think at yeah. some point these gender, you know, shows should be, should become more neutral at some point. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the, I mean, Despacito has been just a, an astounding success. I mean, I think it's, uh, it may be the most downloaded uh, song ever. Yeah, YouTube uh, history, you know, so, over three billion views. Uh, you know, that's that sort of speaks for itself. It's mm-hmm. really, it's really something. And then my last question, Simon, before I let you go: the New York Times in Espanol. You guys have this amazing platform that you've had for about two or three years. Uh, what do you do? You believe that the, that that the New York Times should invest more heavily into the New York Times in Espanol category that they have to reach more of an international uh, and even U.S. Hispanic crowd? Well, just for selfish reasons, of course, I love reading my <laughs> stories when they're translated into Spanish. You know, so I can share them with friends, all, you know, from all around Latin America. And I, and I, I mean, I, I also, I just love having that reach of our coverage. Um, into parts of the world that may that may not have had access to it before. So I'm a big believer in 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 our global editions, whether they whether it's Mandarin um, or or in Spanish. Uh, you know, we're starting up a new operation in English, of course, in Australia, uh, w- which is fascinating. Uh, and you know, th- these are in a sense, you know, new markets for for the type of um, journalism that we do. And, and, you know, we have to remember, you know, as the, the, the ranking of languages go, I mean, English, yes, is the, the predominant lingua franca in the, in the world. Um, it's the language of the United States, of Great Britain, of Australia and New Zealand spoken in many different places, but there's a, there is a universe of other languages out there which, uh, you know, where speakers could be consuming the, the type of journalism that, that we do. And I'm just, you know, I'm a, so I'm a big believer in doing whatever we can to reach them, uh, whether it's in Spanish or in other languages. Uh, Simon Romero, national correspondent for the New York Times. Uh, thank you for writing this article, Spanish Thrives in the U.S. Despite an English-Only Drive. Go read it. Thank you so much for your time, and thanks for being on the Highly Relevant Podcast. Thanks for having me on. Talk to you soon. So I got to tell you this story. This past weekend, I was having dinner at a friend's house when my wife came in and said to me, hey, there's a hashtag by the name of Hispanics Break the Internet that just trended number one on Twitter. Uh, When she said that my first reaction was of surprise, since I feel like we're kind of invisible outside of the music scene right now. So I decided to do some investigative work and found out that a 17-year-old by the name of James Dittar of Mexican-Irish descent had been the person responsible for uniting all, all Latinos of every age and color and background together for the span of 72 hours, and I thought that was really cool. I'm 17 years old. I'm from Eastside San Jose. Um, I identify 
as a Mexican American because that's the culture that I've been exposed to for my entire life. I mean, there's not a lot of like Irish culture, you know what I mean? And you know, we Mexicans, we have a lot of flavor, you know, like we have parties, we have music, we have like delicious food, you know? At my old school, I was one of the only brown people. The, I was like, I went to a private Catholic school. Everyone was really like, you know, they were white. <laughs> but I didn't realize I was definitely an outsider. And I was called like beaner. I was called brownie. And I didn't even realize that that was like a bad thing. I didn't realize I was being insulted. Yeah, until I reached high school. Like I reached my freshman year in high school and then I was like, oh, maybe they shouldn't have been calling me that. And I think that's terrible. <laughs> Um, honestly, I don't take Twitter that seriously. I only use Twitter in my free time at my house. Um, if you ever see me in public, I, like, I hate being on my phone. Like, I hate, like, I feel like I'm rude. Like, there's so much in front of you and you're like, how are you just going to sit on your phone? The main reason I don't speak Spanish is because my mom just never taught me. Yeah. <laughs> so there was a kind of like a trend last August, the break the internet trend, you know, and it was started by black girls, like, you know. So in June of 2016, um, black girls break the internet was trending for a while. And shortly after that, black boys break the internet was trending. And then other communities kind of caught on after a little bit. And it was Hispanics break the internet, um, Asians break the internet. And, you know, like, we all had the spotlight on us, like people of color. I thought the Latino community could use a good pat on the back after I heard about all the, the Nazis and the white supremacists rallying in Charlottesville. You know, everything is pretty uh, like dark and scary right now. And I think the hashtag is like a ray of sunshine. Whenever I post pictures of myself, they do garner like a little bit of attention. So I wasn't surprised when other people started using the tag, but I was most definitely surprised when I saw that it was trending number one. <laughs> I didn't really care too much about like um, the fact that I was trending, but the fact that the members of like my community were like showing so much love and support for each other, it restored my faith in humanity a little bit. You know what I mean? James the Tar, I definitely know what you mean. You really did restore some faith in humanity, even if it was just for a little bit. And before we wrap up here, I leave you with Telemundo anchor Jose Diaz Ballard's impassioned speech this week on the Premios de Mundo award show. It was a speech against hate and discrimination in light of the recent events in Charlottesville, Virginia. It's an inspiring moment for the week ahead. Hope you can take something from it. Listen. In the mark of the alegría of this celebration, we cannot forget that we live in times where the hate and racial discrimination have gained force in the United States. This has provoked strong shocks and caused victims of innocent victims, as happened recently in Charlottesville, Virginia. La comunidad latina no ha sido ajena a este problema. Por el contrario, ha sido blanco de ataques por parte de grupos supremacistas y de aquellos que han tratado de manchar nuestra reputación, tildándonos de criminales. Nosotros, en Telemundo, enfrentaremos al odio con mensajes de amor y de unidad. A los ataques con la firmeza de nuestras convicciones a la discriminación con la diversidad y a la desinformación con la verdad, siempre diciendo las cosas como son y listos a hacer frente a todo mensaje de odio que pretenda discriminar y desacreditar el valioso aporte de todos los latinos en los Estados Unidos. Es que no importa de dónde venimos o qué idioma hablamos, los que informamos Los que creamos historias, los que traemos alegrías, seguiremos trabajando por nuestra comunidad y un futuro mejor para ustedes y sus familias. That's it for episode 46 of the Highly Relevant Podcast. I'd like to thank Latino icons Dolores Huerta, Carlos Santana, I can't believe I'm saying that, Andres Bailly, Simon Romero, and James Attar for stopping by. And thank you guys for taking the time out to listen from your favorite streaming platform wherever you may be. If you like this U.S. Latino podcast, please share it on your social media apps. Tell your friends all about it. And if you can't, have them subscribe to the show. If you want to reach out to us, Email me at highly relevant at showbizcafe.com. That's highly relevant at showbizcafe.com. It depends on you guys to get the word out. 
Hope you enjoy your weekend and stay connected with us via showbizcafe.com. See you next week on another episode of Hi!